When we talk about the relationship between a parameterized curve on the one hand and an implicit equation, like a Cartesian equation, like x squared plus y squared equals one, one of the wrinkles is that this is not a one-to-one -one relationship. There can be many different ways to parameterize a curve that has the same Cartesian equation, right? This is not the only way to parameterize a portion, at least, of the unit circle. Cosine t, sine t is not the only possible way. Um, I could have, for example, as another way to parameterize this unit circle, let's call this original parameterization R1, um, I could also pick another parameterization, let's say R2 of t. Um, and let's say that I pick this to be, I don't know, square root of 1 minus t squared, comma, t. So if I gave you that vector valued function, we could again do the same process to try and verify that this belongs, that this parameterizes a portion of that unit circle. Again, just by taking my x and my y as functions of t and just evaluating, you know, substituting those into my Cartesian equation. Square root of one plus t squared substituted for x and t substituted for y. And if I do that, and I do all of this arithmetic out, the square and the square root here are just going to cancel one another out. Um, oops, I have a typo over here. Sorry, that's 1 minus t squared under the radical. So that when I do that arithmetic, it's 1 minus t squared plus t squared. Those t squareds cancel and I get x squared plus y squared equals one. So both of these vector valued functions, both of these parameterizations um, seem to have a relationship with this unit circle. Right? Every single point which these are describing explicitly is one of the points on this unit circle. But sort of let's try and, and, and look at a potential difference um, between those two before we get started on this activity. So this is our original parameterization, cosine t, sine t, and it parameterizes the unit circle. I'm also going to have my grapher just put the unit circle in here, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So x squared plus y squared equals 1, the whole unit circle. Let's just sort of put that in the background here. Make it sort of, whoops, faint unit circle in the background, just so we can see what we're doing. Take my grid away. So when we parameterize using cosine t, sine t, that's what this curve ends up looking like. But let's imagine the other parameterization. That was the square root of 1 minus t squared was the x coordinate, and t was the y coordinate. If I do that parameterization, it looks like I'm getting some points on the unit circle, but I'm maybe not getting all of the points that I was expecting to get. Um, let's see here. I actually want to do... Let's try and do this. So when I look at all of the points that get described by my other parameterization, all of them lie on the unit circle, but we're not getting the whole unit circle out of this process. So even though we have two different parameterizations that both seem to relate to this unit circle, one of them seems capable of, of giving us the entire unit circle. This one, even though all of its points lie on the unit circle, is not actually giving us the whole unit circle. Does anybody, by the way, see why this parameterization would not be capable of giving us the whole unit circle? Which part is it missing? Well, it doesn't have the negatives, right? The negative which? Which negatives? Because I agree with you, but which, which, which part is it lacking? But the cosine, I think. Well, yeah, but it doesn't have any trigonometry, right? There's no cosine or sine happening here. It's just square root of 1 minus t squared, comma, t. Um, it's not giving me, let's negative just say, the left values. half. Say again? Negative x values? It's not giving me any negative x values. And how does the algebra tell me that? Here are my negative. x values. Square root of 1 minus t squared. Because it's squared, so there's no negative. Well, um, the t is being squared. But more importantly, it's the square root of 1 minus t squared that the output of that function, right, the output of a square root function is always going to be a non-negative value, right? The square root of blank is never going to give me, produce me a negative number. 
parentheses because that's how the square root function works. If I wanted to get the left half, I would probably want to put a minus sign in front of here. If I put a minus sign in front of there, I'm going to get the left half of my unit circle. It still parameterizes a portion of the unit circle because even if I had had a minus sign in front of my 1 minus t squared here, once I square it, that minus sign would have just gone away. So it still satisfies the, the equation for the unit circle. But yeah, so even though my parameterization resides on the unit circle, it doesn't necessarily give me the whole thing. The benefit of the cosine t sine t version is that it actually did give me the whole unit circle when I let t range from 0 to 2 pi. Right? So this is maybe a reason why we might prefer some parameterizations to others depending on the context. Right? If I want to be able to describe the whole unit circle in a single parameterization, I should probably be using this cosine t sine t one. On the other hand, if I'm OK just parameterizing a portion of it, and maybe I don't want to work with trigonometry for some reason, then we might use the other parameterization. So in this activity, what you're being asked to do, um, and probably we've gotten some inspiration already from the examples that we've done here, is investigate, first of all, why it is that each of these four vector valued functions also supply a parameterization of some portion of the unit circle, but then figure out which portion of the unit circle is being parameterized at the same time. So I've given you a link to the Desmos worksheet that I've been using here to do these vector value function parameterized curve graphs. Um, let's take about five minutes or so for you to investigate uh, these four parameterizations, that each one of them is a portion of the unit circle, but which portion of the unit circle is it as t ranges from 0 to 2 pi. So when you looked at these different parameterizations, um, they look pretty different to one another, but what do they all have in common? Let's start with that. When you do the comparison part of the compare and contrast, like what are all of these parameterizations doing? They all describe like the unit circle on the interval 0 to 2 pi. Yeah, they, they all describe the unit circle. Um, so as t ranges from 0 to 2 pi, right? All of these are, are tracing out a portion of the unit circle. Um, so now give me one difference. So there, there's, there's a few ways in which these are different from one another, right? Um, give me a way in which the A and B are different from the C and D. So something that these first had, two had in common that was different from something that these two had in common. Um, one thing I thought was really interesting that I think Peter pointed out was that um, the, the third one doesn't start at the same point. Okay. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, so the starting point is different. In other words, the, the value of r of 0, right? That would be the starting point. Um, yeah, some of these had different starting points than others. So both <laughs> this one and this was part A, and then part B was we just put 2t in there. They both had the same starting point. Um, then when we switched so that the cosine was here instead, t plus pi and sine of t plus Hi. pi, now the starting point was, in this example, the starting point was negative 1, 0. Um, but what's another thing that's different when we're using the cosine sine formulation here versus the sine cosine formulation for parts A and B? So one of, this is one of the things that I want to do to kind of connect us into the next section as we're getting ready to go there. But if you look at how this parameterization is evolving versus how it evolves if we swap the sine with the cosine. After all, in x squared plus y squared equals 1, that plus is commutative, right? So it doesn't matter whether we have right. x be the cosine or y be the sine or vice versa, right? But if I have the cosine as the x... My parameterization is doing this. If I have the sine mm -hmm. as my x, the parameterization is doing that. What's the difference I'm trying to get at here? Like clockwise versus counterclockwise? Like the clockwise going. versus counterclockwise, right. That mm -hmm. when I parameterize with the cosine as the x, the it seemingly, at least, we're always getting a counterclockwise parameterization, which is the 
usual convention in trigonometry for how you measure angles, right? Angles usually in right. get measured mm -hmm. as counterclockwise from the positive x axis. And so I think that's why there is a preference for cosine as the x and sine as the y. Um, and so that's another thing we can talk about with respect to parameterizations, is we can talk about the direction of the parameterization, right? Um, that even though they're parameterizing the same circle, you know, this version is parameterizing it in a clockwise sense, and if we swap sine and cosine, it's in a anticlockwise sense. Um, also, what if I, what do you think would happen if I replace t with minus t? It doesn't change the starting point, right? The, the r of zero point. Would it uh, go down instead of going up? Yeah, certainly that looks like what it starts to do, right? Mm -hmm. And then it just ends up still parameterizing the same unit circle, right? Because cosine mm -hmm. squared of minus t plus sine squared of minus t is still equal to one. But here was another way to change the orientation of the parameterization from counterclockwise to clockwise, right? Swapping out t for minus t. So it's parameterizing the same curve, but it's doing it backwards, right? Instead of running time into the future, we're running time into the past. Um, it would be the sort of physics way to think about replacing mm -hmm. t by minus t. Um, okay, uh, give me one more difference uh, that you found. Like w one of these, well, yeah, so one of these was different from the other three. Uh, which, which one and why? What was the most interesting? The, uh, the square one? The square, e. yeah, let's take a look at that square one. So when I parameterize cosine t, sine t, if I just sort of let my t range over, whoops, I don't want it to bounce back and forth. I just want it to go in one direction. Uh, how do I get back to where I was here? Oh. Sorry. Okay. So in the original cosine t, sine t, if we let t evolve over constant intervals of time, it looks like we're going around this circle in one way. But then if I replace those t's with t squareds, whoops. How's that different? So how would you describe what's happening in this parameterization? You're covering more ground? It looks like we end up covering more ground. Mm -hmm. um, what, if anything, can we say about the way in which that ground is being covered? So in the first time interval here, we're covering a little bit. In the next time interval, we're covering a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, a lot more, a lot more. So what's kind of happening here as t evolves? Well, like the difference is getting bigger because it's squared. The differences are getting bigger. Right. So that t squared as the argument, right, that if I choose equally spaced apart t values, right, then I'm going to end up that t squared is going to output successively bigger and bigger and bigger inputs to the cosine and sine function. So it's almost like this parameterization is starting out actually a little bit slower than the original, but then it sort of speeds up as we go along. Um, so as soon as we bring questions like speed and slowness and speed changing and those kinds of questions into the mix, you can see why we're going to want to do calculus uh, in, you know, after the break today um, when we start to look at derivatives of these parameterizations and what those derivatives can tell us. Because we'd like to be able to develop that language of saying sort of how fast is this parameterization? If I'm in this car driving around the circle, what am I going to see on my speedometer, right? Um, are the original, if we just go back to cosine t sine t, what, what would you say about the speed of this parameterization? If I'm in this car, what is my speedometer likely saying? Constant? Yeah, it looks like I would just be driving at 20 miles an hour or whatever around the circle, right, the whole time. It seems like the speed of this parameterization looks constant. To me, whereas the speed in the parameterization with the squares in it, not so much. Right? 
looks like it starts out slow, but then it's accelerating as we go around mm -hmm. the circle. Right? So that's the kind of thing that when we get to the calculus and the derivatives of these parameterizations uh, in about 30 minutes or so from now, um, that's what we're going to be able to put on a more precise foundation once we have the tools of calculus at our fingertips.